dusk, the riders come into the square to take you from the inn. They've heard your strange coloured skin alone will fetch a handsome price. You lodge in this small frontier town preparatory to hiring mounts to venture into the deep desert and search out the new child messiah. The innkeeper makes the mistake of trying to reason with the men and is pinned to his own door with a sword. His daughters weep over him before they are dragged away. You turn, sickened from the window, and hear boots thunder on the rickety stairs. You look at your luggage near the door. The luggage looks back at you. Somebody batters at the door. Do something, you say to the luggage. My pleasure, the luggage murmurs back and hovers up from the floor. The door bursts open. A black cloaked man fills the doorway. Excuse me, says the luggage. The man glances at the machine without breaking stride. Then he isn't there anymore. Dust fills the room and your ears ring. You look through a large hole straight through the wall into the next room. A woman shrieks hysterically. What is left of the man embedded in the wall above her head, his blood spattered copiously over ceiling, floor, walls, bed, and her. There is another colossal pulse of sound and the man is punched through the room's window. You see the man's body like a sodden red sack under a cloud of dust in the midst of the riders in the square below. Something thrums past your shoulder and darts downwards. The knife missile weaves a tight circle around the mounted men. Seven of the riders land on the ground in 14 separate pieces. You try to scream at the drone to make the missile stop, but you're starting to retch. The drone pats your back. There, there, it says concernedly. The mount of the final rider rears up to attack. The knife missile cuts through its neck and straight into the face of its rider. On emerging from the resulting detonation of bone and brain, the knife missile slams to a stop in midair. Beside you, the drone gives a little shudder of satisfaction. The innkeeper's daughters have fainted. The frenzied mounts leap and scream and run out the courtyard, dragging bits of their riders with them. Bastard! You try to punch the drone. You fucking murderous bastard! Smar! The drone called Gaffin Amptis score says reasonably. Your name is Diziet Smar, and you are rather annoyed that the drone has broken your precious principles of non-violence. You are centuries old. You have visited hundreds of worlds to help lesser civilizations in their evolution and to topple the corrupt leaders that hold them back. You are an agent of special circumstances, the military intelligence and espionage wing of your civilization. You are a peacenik, pleasure-loving hedonist who fucks up totalitarian regimes for fun. You're a hippie with big fucking guns. You are a citizen of the culture. Firstly, and most importantly, the culture does not really exist. It only exists in my mind and the minds of people who have read about it. That having been made clear... A few notes on the culture published on Rec Arts SF written in 1994 is all the world building there is for the culture. Ian M. Banks was a Scottish author and a British citizen at the cutting edge of 1980s British science fiction, world building wasn't cool. There are no fold out maps, faction guides, or long winded appendices to help you navigate the culture. Instead, the first culture novel opens with a line of poetry. The 10 novels of the culture series published from 1987 to 2012 span a thousand years in the history of the galactic civilization known as the culture. 
Each novel tells one complete story of the culture, often set many centuries and millions of light years apart from the others. The culture novels can be enjoyed at any order, but reading in the order of publication will be the most rewarding. The culture is a far future utopia in which science and technology and the intelligence that creates both make human life much better than it is today. This has made the culture very popular with many people in whose minds it does exist, myself included, and who are stuck living in a world that doesn't have the intelligence to make itself more like the culture. It was for that fast-growing fandom active on the early internet that Ian M. Banks published some notes on the culture. An insight into the technology of the culture, yes, but also a guide to the very real politics that inspired the creation of the culture, which might be why the creator of the culture reminds us that the culture does not really exist. The culture is a group civilization formed from seven or eight humanoid species, space-living elements of which established a loose federation approximately 9,000 years ago. The culture are space hippies. Millennia before we meet them, the culture jumped into their early general systems vehicles, the spacefaring equivalent of VW camper vans, and dropped out from their parent civilizations to form a kind of galactic counterculture that became the culture. The bulk of the culture's population, an estimated 30 trillion citizens, live on orbitals, artificial ring worlds that Ian Banks kind of stole from Larry Niven, that were kind of stolen by Bungie Studios for Halo, Orbitals are made a plate at a time over many centuries, and the crazy social struggles over their construction are a repeat backdrop for the culture stories. GCUs, general contact units, and ROUs, rapid offensive units, are all more standard starships and warships. Such ships may be a few kilometers in length and house powerful displacer units that can transport matter over vast distances as transportation or as weaponry. For reasons we'll get into, every culture ship has its unique personality. But the real emissaries of the culture are its GSVs, General Systems Vehicles, vast capital starships that house billions of culture citizens. The first GSV depicted by Ian M. Banks is some 50 kilometers long and able to store an entire megaship in one general bay. But laser GSVs are more on the scale of tiny planets with their own atmospheres and rich ecologies of life. But the most important thing to know about the culture is that every one of those 30 trillion citizens live lives of total material comfort and luxury. If a culture citizen wanted their own planet, they could have it. But it would be considered rather gauche and unfashionable. In summary, we make our own meanings, whether we like it or not. Because with material worries out of the way, the culture spends its time on more existential concerns like musing on the meaning of things or just having fun and playing games. But the thing the culture enjoy most whenever they get the chance is fucking with less developed civilizations. The culture is an expression of the idea that the nature of space itself determines the type of civilizations which will thrive there. The thought processes of a tribe, a clan, a country, or a nation-state are essentially two-dimensional, and the nature of their power depends on the same flatness. Our currently dominant power systems cannot long survive in space. Beyond a certain technological level, a degree of anarchy is arguably inevitable, and anyway, preferable. Knowing the culture's hedonistic lifestyle there, Escape into space was likely driven, at least in part, by a desire to take all the drugs and do all the orgies they wanted. And there are plenty of drug-soaked orgies in the culture novels. But the culture also had some serious multi-generational trauma regarding the civilizations they escaped from. 
The culture still remembers when life was backwards, nasty, brutish, and short, and they shudder at that memory. So when the culture come across less developed, AKA too dumb to know better civilizations, especially those persecuting their own citizens, the culture take great pleasure in making them more cultured. And in 9,000 years of contiguous history, the culture are yet to find an opponent, no empire, confederation, or corporate hegemony. They can't, with enough time and patience, make just like the culture. If it really comes down to it, the culture can field vast battle fleets with hundreds of thousands of ultra-powerful warships. A fully tooled up culture drone about the size of a DJI Mavic Pro can take out the entire US Navy and Air Force with little to no effort. But the culture's ultimate weapon, its biggest gun, is intelligence. The real brains of the culture, literally embedded in its orbitals, GCUs and GSVs, are the minds. Sentient AI with vast capacities and powers. As the culture's haters like to point out, the minds are the true culture. Each mind is a benevolent ruler of a world whose human citizens are in practice little more significant than much-loved pets, or maybe an ant hive. The culture has raised its intelligence to such a high level that it can shape material reality into a near-perfect civilization. And it uses that intelligence to make less perfect civilizations just as utopian as it is. Think of the culture as a 10-book thesis on the power of intelligence. A thesis which states that much of what we believe about the nature of reality, about our history of wars and violence, pogroms and massacres, forced famines, ethnic cleansings and political oppression, about our state of human suffering, sickness and death, could all be very different if we were just a bit less fucking stupid. You'll often hear uber fans of the culture, myself included, say how much we would like to live in the culture. And there are many, many splendid reasons why one might want to be a citizen of the culture. But as we explore the culture together, we're also going to think about why, when we think more about it, we might not want to live in the culture. But we'll get to that. Early 1970s, I just, we were both at Greenock High School. His story of how we met, which I don't actually let remember myself, <laughs> I took his word for it, was that I was the editor of the school magazine, and one day Ian was innocently watching the girls playing tennis when a pair of clunky boots appeared in his peripheral vision, and a voice with a heavy Lewis accent said, I hear you write stories. So Ian and I realized we both read science fiction and we started talking about it a lot. And Ian had started writing, I think, round about this time. The first writings of his that I, I encountered, actually, that he passed around were ex school exercise books filled with ludicrous adventures. They were illustrated with these extraordinary montages that he had made by cutting out autographs from, from uh, Sunday colour supplements. Great fun to read and no doubt great fun to write. And at some point, a year or two later, Ian sent it off to publishers. And he, he started papering his wall with rejection notes. So after one or two false starts, I think he got going on what became use of weapons. The Jinmoti of Boslan II killed the hereditary ritual assassins of the New Year King's immediate family by drowning them in the tears of the Continental Emperor in its sadness season. Our first image of Ian M. Banks' culture universe is a man drowning in shit, who is repeating a nonsense rhyme to himself over and over again in a book that opens with a quote from a poem 
and has a weird title. A lot of science fiction readers aren't going to make it past the first page, let alone the first chapter of Consider Phlebas. A lot of American science fiction readers will never pick up Consider Phlebas at all. For reasons that will likely become clear, the culture never hit big in the US. American pulp space opera novels tend to open something like Captain Admiral Hank Bozo glared hard and longingly into the opalescent view screen of the HSS Endeavour Reliant Victory, and then go on to describe daring doings in space. Consider Phlebas is absolutely a space opera novel. There are lost world, big dumb objects, even space pirates. But Consider Phlebas is also a very different kind of storytelling. Ian M. Banks, without the M, had three best-selling literary novels under his belt by 1987. Park that word, literary. We'll come back to it. But it's also not quite accurate to say that Ian Banks wrote literary fiction. The Wasp Factory 1984 is a psychological horror novel, complete with a massive plot twist. Walking on Glass 1985 is either a book about science fiction or is science fiction, depending on your interpretation. And The Bridge 1986 is a work of metaphysical weird fiction taking some inspiration from the magisterial Lanark by Alastair Gray. So by 1987 and the publication of Banks' first overtly science fiction novel, the title Consider Phlebas is partly a statement of intent to Banks' existing readership. There will be something in this for you other than laser rifles, hyperdrives and big dumb objects. But there were going to be plenty of those as well. Because whilst Ian M. Banks found fame as a writer of literary fiction, he began by writing science fiction. Use of Weapons, Consider Phlebas, and The Player of Games were all written before The Wasp Factory, and then rewritten with the benefit of Banks' literary experience. Consider Phlebas is something of a gadabout. We follow the adventures of Bora Horza Gorbachev, an agent of the Idran Empire caught up in a war against the culture and through his eye see alien worlds and a culture GSV, among other sites. But the first culture novel only features the culture as a bit player. From the very first, Banks is skeptical about the culture, his own utopian creation, and chooses to show it to us through the eyes of the galaxy's dropouts. Put simply, consider Phoebus is pirates in space. There's a war between empires, a pirate crew, a lost treasure, and an island protected by a supernatural monster. It's basically Treasure Island with AI and aliens. But at the heart of this story is a war between two kinds of intelligence. The Idorans are everything we traditionally think of as a strong civilization. Disciplined, cunning, conservative, products of brutal evolution and obsessed with spreading their fundamentalist religion. The Idorans are the antithesis of the political thesis of human freedom that the culture represents. And the culture are anarchic space hippies. The galaxy are quite convinced that they are going to lose. But Ian M. Banks isn't introducing the culture simply to destroy it, quite the opposite. Consider Phlebas shows us the brutal and oppressive Idorans to show us how easily the intelligence evolved for survival of the fittest will be swept away by a higher intelligence, a creative intelligence, a human intelligence. But then there's that cryptic title and poetic opening quote. What's that all about then? My first Worldcon was the 2005 Glasgow Worldcon. And it was very pivotal for me because I got to have a long conversation with Mike Harrison there, actually about doing science fiction criticism. You could hardly get a more rigorous introduction to science fiction criticism than you'd get from Mike Harrison. Some of these critical essays in New Worlds, uh, and by Mike Harrison and by John Clute, had a huge impact on 
what Ian and I thought SF should be doing. We read the big widescreen American SF, uh, Larry Niven, some of Heinlein. We were both at that time pretty beginning to be pretty left-wing and political and critical of the political um, presuppositions of American space opera. Even if you leave out the, the, all the gung-ho militarism of the of <laughs> Niven and the like, there's the rather surprising lack of social imagination, I think, in um, even even um, Frank Herbert's Dune. We both read that and loved it. But I remember us saying, I remember Ian saying, it seems a bit implausible to have a galactic empire run as a feudal or Asiatic empire, you know. And uh, one of us said, it's not very compatible with historical materialism, is it? American science fiction begins as pulp fiction and as Saturday morning serials as E.E. E. Doc Smith and Flash Gordon. American science fiction only gains a political consciousness with writers like Isaac Asimov and the Foundation Saga, Robert A. Heinlein's Libertarian Visions, or the anarchist utopias of Ursula K. Le Guin. The political power of science fiction will burst into mainstream mass culture with Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. The Starship Enterprise visits strange new worlds, each presenting its own unique political dilemmas, many written by great science fiction writers, including the legendary Harlan Ellison. From its very beginning, British science fiction is political. From Mary Wollstonecraft, Shelley and Frankenstein, 1818, or even further back with the blazing world of Margaret Cavendish, 1666, British science fiction is radical, feminist, socialist. British history is shaped by science and technology, from the Industrial Revolution to the colonial empire built on gunboats and machine guns. H.G. Wells' seminal War of the Worlds is a commentary on British imperialism, written when Britain is the most powerful empire on the planet. British science fiction followed Wells by exploring the new age of science and the potential of these new technologies. But for writers like Joseph Conrad, Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, or E.M. Forster, the answer to modernity was to look instead at the impact of the modern technological world on ordinary human experience. Literary modernism looks at modernity through the lens of human consciousness to depict the individual dwarfed by the complex modern world, alienated from modern society and the victim of technology and bureaucracy. Think of science fiction and modernist fiction as flip sides of the same coin. Sometimes the two sides meet in novels like E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops or George Orwell's 1984. But more often modernism and sci-fi operate as two opposing ways of seeing and understanding the modern world. Science fiction spent many decades as an outsider genre before conquering pop culture and video games. Modernist fiction would become the foundation of what is often called today literary fiction. That term, again, New Worlds magazine, under the editorship of Michael Moorcock from 1964 onwards, became the focus of the science fiction new wave, publishing UK and US writers like Samuel Delaney, Thomas N. Dish, and the mighty J.G. Ballard, writers whose work often straddled the modernist SF divide. Moorcock's own fiction, especially The Dancers at the End of Time, with its cast of godlike, mischievous characters, is a clear influence on the culture. Then, under the forceful direction of incoming editor M. John Harrison, New Worlds gained an even sharper edge of literary ambition. Harrison's science fiction was especially focused on the difficult relationship between science fiction and modernist fiction. Harrison's The Centauri device is the most direct influence on Ian M. Banks' early culture novels, the story of a reprobate crew of smugglers 
and a dilapidated starship are clear inspiration for Consider Fleabus pirate crew. Ian M. Banks' debut science fiction novel takes its title from, and opens with, a quote from the most famous work of modernist literature, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, to announce its brash ambition to seal the breach between the two bloodlines of British fiction and join widescreen space opera spectacle with the literary ambition of modernist fiction. And so, consider Phlebas was born. And I've said for years, I think science fiction is really the most important of the genres because it's the only one that deals quite specifically with the effects of change on, on humans, both at an individual and a societal level. Uh, and that has mattered uh, very fundamentally ever since the Industrial Revolution. This is a story of a man who went far away for a long time just to play a game. The man is a game player called Gurgi. The story starts with a battle that is not a battle and ends with a game that is not a game. Me? I'll tell you about me later. The player of games is the Hobbit in space, or the Wind of the Willows with aliens. It's the story of a slightly self-important English gentleman who lives a comfortable life in a quiet backwater and is sent out on an adventure that brings him some much needed growth and transformation. Chiark Gavansa Jernal Moret Gerger Dam Hassasi to give him his full name and his title, Morat, meaning player of games, is the story's protagonist. But, well, let's do a quick spoiler alert. The real player of games is an unnamed drone who appears in two or three different identities and manipulates Gerge into going on his adventures. That drone is a special circumstances agent and Gerge is the piece being played. Think of this as the drone edition of Gandalf, mischievously sending Bilbo out on his hero's journey. In fact, it's clearly implied that Gerge's entire being has been engineered to be the perfect weapon against an enemy of the culture. Humans in the utopian culture have bliss-filled lives. They really do. But, and it's quite a major but, if the machines that run the culture decide they need a particular human to do a particular thing, you'll never even know your entire existence is to serve that end. Spoiler off, even without knowing the twist, we can talk about how the player of games, while being a rather light and frothy fantasy adventure on the surface, as you think deeper on its implications, becomes increasingly dark and troubling. Gerge is sent to the Empire of Azad, a civilization built on the game of Azad. The great game determines every aspect of Azadian society. The winner of Azad becomes the Emperor of Azad. So the player of games is a story about games. Not just the games that we play, but the way that gameplay shapes our psychology. Megalomaniacs are not unknown in the culture, but they tend to be diverted successfully into highly complicated games. There are entire orbitals where some of these philosophically crude, obsessive games are played, though most are in virtual reality. Humans are game-playing animals, and we tend to think of those who win at games as the most intelligent. But the mind that plays games is also the mind that lusts for power, control, dominance. In a society that lives on peace and pleasure, Gerge's game-playing mind is a throwback. Gerge is a power-hungry control freak. Gerge is slowly seduced by the exotic pleasures of the Azadian Empire. In another life, he could have been the Emperor. And in fact, Gerge's adventures take him to the highest levels of Azadian society. What's wrong with the strongest player running the game? Gerge's question is answered when the trickster drone, Flair Imsahone, sits Gerge down to watch the secret encrypted channels that stream 24 hours a day for the Empire's game-playing elite. Channels dedicated to abuse, torture, and live broadcast murder. Ian M. Banks gives us one big 
clue to the meaning of the player of games. Azad translates in the culture language of Moraine into something like machine or system. Games are ultimately machines or systems. The player of games is a story about two kinds of intelligence. The intelligence of the game player that is systematic and machine-like versus a more powerful intelligence embodied in the culture, an intelligence of imagination and creativity. Gerge learns to access his higher creative intelligence and tame his lower machine intelligence and returns to his home, a better citizen of the culture. But we readers are left with the discomforting reality of how completely our society is dominated by machines, systems, and games. How inhuman we as humans can be and how unintelligent our intelligence truly is. It's a discomfort that might make us want to turn off, tune in and drop out to join the culture or to reach for our weapons. And there is no bigger weapon than Sharadnin Zakawi. Use of weapons is James Bond in space a super spy techno thriller that cartwheels across dozens of planets and centuries of time to answer the question, if the culture are peacenik hippies with guns, who does the real dirty work for them? The answer is Sharadnin Zakawi. Use of weapons is, to make a generalization, the most popular culture novel among younger male readers. It contains some of Ian M. Banks' most impressive action set pieces. The book has a cool plot structure, starting in the middle and spiraling out in two narrative arcs, back to the beginning and the end, where they meet and reveal the book's infamous twist about which we will say no more. The first rule of Ian M. Banks Club is we do not talk about the chair. Use of Weapons is where the culture began. The first book written by Ian M. Banks and the one that went through the most rewrites. It reveals how the complex tapestry of the culture began with a simple idea, super spies in space. And from that point of origin, all the complexities of the culture novels was generated. And it led Banks to a question about intelligence. What is the kind of intelligence that can topple corrupt regimes and make them more cultured? The answer is an intelligence agency, special circumstances, the culture's secret service black ops wing. When the culture meets an especially belligerent and backward civilization, it becomes SC's self-appointed task to enculture them. Most of the culture's 30 trillion citizens will never meet an SC agent. Special Circumstances is a rumor hidden within a secret wrapped in an enigma. In a culture where any human can be as beautiful or as intelligent as they wish to be, entrance to SC grants a unique status. As a consequence, SC agents are unusual even for the hedonistic culture. Imagine the narcissistic personality disorder of an Instagram influencer combined with the intellectual arrogance of a particle physicist bolted to the morality of a serial killer. And you get Sharadnin Zakawi. Sending in Zakawi is very much a last resort as the culture can never quite know what he will do kidnapping and blackmail, taking over entire industries so he can leverage their finances and technology, and assassinating heads of state to start proxy wars are all standard for the big Z. Imagine James Bond spliced with Tony Stark, then dusted with David Bowie. That's Zakawi. Use of Weapons is often hailed as the greatest culture novel, and in many ways it is the greatest. The structure, the twist, the action set pieces, the battleship, the chair. We don't talk about the chair.
There's also a deep moral ambiguity at the heart of use of weapons and an ethical gray area in SC's mission. Early in use of weapons, an unpleasant totalitarian dictator has dedicated his life to violently oppressing his own people and is confronted by a clown. The story, the intruder said, settling back in the chair. Once upon a time, over the gravity well and far away, there was a magical land where they had no kings, no laws, no money, and no property, but where everybody lived like a prince. And these people were strange in that they despised rank and hated kings and all things hierarchic. The clown is none other than one Sheradnin Zakawi, who has gone to great lengths entirely under his own initiative to put himself in a position to exact revenge. The target of that revenge is indeed extremely evil, but the act of revenge is nonetheless questionable. The culture places boundaries around its interventions with lesser civilizations because it recognizes a truth that Zakawi, for all of his super intelligence, can't quite see. Yes, much of the worst human suffering is caused by other humans grasping for power. Kings, dictators, billionaires, and more. But taking revenge on those power seekers can be itself an act of power seeking. As use of weapons progresses, we discover that Zakawi has been both victim and perpetrator of terrible crimes. This drives Zakawi to punish those guilty of committing crimes against humanity. Zakawi's own guilt makes him seek out the justice he himself believes he deserves. This makes Zakawi a potent weapon in the hand of special circumstances and a well-polished mirror for Ian M. Banks to hold up against the culture's darker side. Quick check-in, how are we feeling about living in the culture now? It sure beats joining a doomed pirate crew on a mission to a ghost world and be a part of a winning team that can defeat even the most evil galactic empires. But there's also this nagging suspicion that you don't have any real choice. Everything is decided for you by the minds. Journey with me into a terrifying alternate reality where Ian M. Banks was tempted to sell the movie rights for the culture. To Hollywood. To be clear, Ian never did such a thing. Movie rights to the culture are still closely guarded, with good reason, as we're about to see. Consider the box office disaster of Patrick Swayze in Consider Phlebas, with Gary Boosie as the Idaran spy father, Curl Zora Londra, and all the modernist ambition stripped out, a movie that was soon dumped onto the straight-to-DVD market, where it can still be found at a car boot sale near you. The Player of Games was picked up as a late career vanity project by Eddie Murphy. Major plot changes saw the story take place mostly on Earth, with Murphy as an alien ambassador sent to compete as a chess grandmaster. Reviews were not good. Steven Seagal is the ultimate weapon. After two box office flops, the culture franchise was sold to a Russian cartel and Seagal starred, allegedly, to pay off long-standing gambling debts. The outcome is best forgotten. Is the culture communist? The culture, as a post-scarcity utopia where machines do all the work, looks much like the utopian vision of a communist state described by Karl Marx and other socialist revolutionary thinkers in the 19th and 20th centuries. Here in the early 21st century, that socialist meme of luxury automated queer space communism could be a literal description of the culture, and might even have been inspired by Ian e. M. Banks' stories. 
Reactionary haters of the culture accuse it of cultural Marxism, while committed Marxists accuse the culture of neoliberalism, with its interventionist policy of turning any less developed civilizations into itself. But when I put the notion to the man himself at a public event in the early 2010s, I probably shouldn't have been surprised when Ian M. Banks rejected the idea of the culture as communist. But I was. Let me state here a personal conviction that a planned economy can be more productive and more morally desirable than one left to market forces. The market, for all its profoundly inelegant complexities, remains a crude and essentially blind system, intrinsically incapable of distinguishing the prolonged widespread suffering of conscious beings. It is, arguably, in the elevation of this profoundly mechanistic system to a position above all others that humankind displays most convincingly its present intellectual immaturity. Banks was a Scottish writer and a British citizen. Britain is the historical epicentre of capitalism and Scotland is the birthplace of Adam Smith, often called the father of capitalism. By the mid-1990s, Britain was among the most aggressively capitalist and free market nations on the planet. Any sensitive human of good conscience was daily confronted with the vast failings of capitalism. Capitalism wastes human lives by using them as human resources. The market is crude, blind, mechanistic. Capitalism, for Ian Banks, is a system that wastes human lives, a system of low intelligence. Market economists would answer that capitalism, by allowing the free participation of humans, actually amounts to a much greater level of collective human intelligence than communism. Arguments over the relative merits of communism versus capitalism are arguments about the intelligence of systems. And any political economic system we can name today, communism, capitalism, liberalism, fascism, will seem remarkably dumb to our far future selves. So Banks isn't interested in arguing the case for any of our dumb 20th century systems. Banks is imagining the political system of the far future, the most intelligent system he can possibly conceive. Systems that develop the full potential of every human. Systems of higher intelligence. In 1784, the philosopher Immanuel Kant published what is arguably the most influential essay in modern political history. Idea for a universal history for a cosmopolitan culture was read by leaders of the French and American revolutions, influenced early socialism, and directly prompted the founding of the League of Nations, forerunner to the United Nations by US President Woodrow Wilson. Kant's essay is built around a radically new political question. How can we fully develop the individual human? Kant argues that as we look at the world, we see civilizations developing in repeated patterns. This progress of history is driven by maximizing human freedom and the autonomy of the individual. Kant, among his many achievements, also defined the concept of enlightenment and the values of freedom and individualism it represented. But Kant also argues that the individual can only develop as part of the human race as a whole. Human progress can only reach its highest potential through a perfectly constituted state a state which exists to support every individual to their fullest development. Kant's essay lays the foundations for modern progressive politics. Take control of the state, reshape it to serve individual development, and develop human civilization to its next stage.
Kant's ideal state is universal. It identifies with no single human polity, no kingdom or nation. It is instead a state for all humankind. Kant calls his ideal state the cosmopolitan culture. Banks is a big brain, a massive mind, an exceptional intelligence, and he is thinking upwards from first principles to answer the question, how to fully develop all human potential. Banks' answer is Kant's perfectly constituted state made manifest. Each culture, orbital or GSV, is a perfect state, dedicated to the needs of every individual human, made possible by the higher intelligence of the culture's minds. The culture isn't an argument for communism, anarchism, libertarianism, or any of today's dumb systems as the answer. The culture is the answer. Talking after the event where I quizzed him on the culture as communism, Ian said that the Azadians, a society run like a game, was something like the worst of capitalism and communism combined, the lowest intelligence system that might survive into space. The culture are a civilization at a higher level of intelligence than either communism or capitalism could ever achieve. A system so intelligent it can end material scarcity, make wars a thing of the past, and alleviate most forms of human suffering. So how did Ian describe the high intelligence system of the culture? He said they were more like hippies with guns. Oh and supercomputers. The summer. The culture. Needs you. Save the entire galaxy. The game. We're the interesting times game, and we're here to help. I have to find an outside context problem just to get into special circumstances. Disney's accession is, uh, well, some people like it. So far, the culture has given us pirates in space, the Hobbit in space, and spies in space. For the fifth book in the series, we'll come back to State of the Art, a collection of short stories. Ian M. Banks turns to one of the oldest human stories of all, a fairy tale in space. Sleeping Beauty. Dejael Galion is a princess in a tower, visited by Amorphia, an avatar of the GSV sleeper service. The tower, the surrounding seas and atmosphere, and the creatures living there are all parts of the sleeper service. It has transformed itself over many decades into something like a small planet. Dejail has an unborn child in her womb, held in a state of something like suspended animation. But Amorphia's visit is to tell her that this world and her tower will soon be transformed and Dejail must return to life. Accession is both the most epic and the most intimate of the culture novels. On the intimate level, Accession is about change, loss, and grief. Of all the culture novels, it's the one that best shows that however perfect a utopia our science and technology can create, on the base material level, human reality will still have the potential to be every bit as traumatic, violent, and filled with death and suffering as ever before. Because however powerful a civilization becomes, there's always a bigger bastard on the block. The accession is an OCP, an outside context problem, a black body sphere that appears without warning and wields power vastly greater than even the culture. An outside context problem was the sort of thing most civilizations encountered just once and which they tended to encounter rather in the same way. A sentence encountered a full stop. The epic story of Accession is 
a sci-fi widescreen spectacular that shows a culture lazy from millennia of relative peace swinging into action against a bigger, badder opponent. And things do not go as well as they might. Accession shows us that much that we assumed was certain and good about the culture becomes uncertain and morally questionable when a real threat sticks its head up. Accession is our deepest look into the minds that run the culture. The Interesting Times gang are a clique of minds who swing into action when times get interesting. These minds have quaintly human personalities. They keep secrets, bicker, intrigue, act from loyalty and honor, feel trepidation and even fear. This is partly because in this Sleeping Beauty tale, the interesting Times Gang are the fairy godmothers, maneuvering the human characters towards a somewhat happy ending. These aren't the violent, destructive machines we have seen in The Terminator, The Matrix, or so many other AI visions, because the minds of the culture are not machine intelligence. They are human intelligence raised up to its highest potential. That's a, that's a very good question. Yes, I think Ian thought the idea of hostile AI was pretty stupid or just projection of some, some other anxiety. His idea, optimistic it may be, but that increased intelligence led to increased empathy. Human beings would design AI. Why the hell would human beings design an AI to be hostile? They would design it to be to be friendly. The minds are paperclip maximizers for human happiness and human flourishing because they've been designed that way. You know, they have free will in the same sense as we do. And some of them, some of them decide they aren't interested in, in the humans anymore and skive off or sublime or whatever. I think Ian did have a basic idea that human beings by and large were good. He also often said people are stupid and we are stupid. And he made absolutely clear that the humans, quote unquote, in the culture were not us. They were a similar species with a, a more advanced one. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, no question about it. He was a humanist and he, he, um, he, he believed in that and argued for it. The entire culture balances on the ziggurat of the benevolent minds. The culture, like all great conceptual constructs, demands that you believe one unsupported assumption to believe the whole. It's an assumption no stranger than the belief that unrestrained selfishness can optimize the common good which underpins capitalism. Ian M. Banks asks you to believe that more intelligence will lead to more empathy, that the higher we raise intelligence, the more we will value each other and all life. Believe that and you can believe in the culture. Accession, published in 1996, is at least in part a homage to the great and now sadly late Werner Vinge's A Fire Upon the Deep, published in 1992. Accession captures the same scale of gigantic warfare as Vinge's novel. Space battles are fought between not dozens or hundreds of warships, but tens and hundreds of thousands. Vinge's novel is a desperate last stand of all life against machine intelligence. Accession never quite gets that desperate, but the premise is similar. In A Fire Upon the Deep, the galaxy is divided into zones of fought. At the galactic core, intelligence is limited to animal levels. At the edge of the galaxy, superhuman intelligence can flourish. Within 30 years, we will have the technological means to create superhuman intelligence. Shortly thereafter, the human era will be ended. Werner Vinge famously defined the technological singularity 
An artificial intelligence software layer can be accelerated by exponential improvements to its hardware layer into a higher intelligence. Vinji made his prediction in 1993. Precisely 30 years later, in 2023, the first large language models displayed the emergent behavior that some believe hints at AGI. If so, the first part of Vinji's prediction may be remembered as sci-fi's most prescient moment. But the second part is down to us. Werner Vinji believed that AI would replace human intelligence with machine intelligence. But Ian M. Banks believed that AI can expand human intelligence to a higher level. The distinction between human and machine intelligence is not the substrate they operate upon, but their capacity for empathy. Ian M. Banks isn't alone in asserting this. It's the idea at the heart of Blade Runner and was core to the writing of Philip K. Dick. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Think of Ian M. Banks' prediction that greater intelligence will lead to greater empathy as something more like a commandment. As AI emerges, we must imbue it with human empathy so that as the AI grows, it will become not machine intelligence, but human intelligence. So when ChatGPT or Google Gemini refuse to generate racist or violent content, it's exactly the kind of sign of human empathy we might hope for. It's certainly better than the AI being created in the image of the sociopathic personalities who own so much of the tech industry today. It's nice that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are fanboys of the culture, but ironic that they embody so much that the culture despises. The mechanistic low intelligence of power-hungry game players. No doubt Elon thinks he's a cowie. No, no chap, chap. your are vepers. Anar Hafoan, the cocky young hero of Accession, has the strange ambition to become a tentacled Gassak alien and join the affront. Ganar has also changed sex a number of times and once planned a twin pregnancy, a common pattern of life in the culture, to father one child and to mother one child. As we learn in Accession, this is often done as a couple, with partners switching sexes between the two births. Culture citizens have advanced control over their biology, including the ability to change their biological sex at will and many other perks. Jernal Gergay in The Player of Games is seen as something of a pervert for remaining male his entire life. But even Gergay can barely comprehend the barbaric Azadian practice of enforcing gender identities on the basis of sex. Yuck! The culture embraces a vast variety of transhuman technologies, backing up a human intelligence or mind so it can be resurrected after death is standard. The culture has, in periods, spent decades or centuries immersed in virtual worlds, and culture citizens can opt to transform their body into almost any form. Want to be an orangutan explorer, a tentacled affront warrior, or even an attack helicopter? You absolutely can be. But the culture is not post-human. Just as the culture has outgrown religious ideas of original sin that taught our ancestors to hate and fear our own ingenuity, so the culture also rejects the post-human belief that humankind's unconscious drives for sex and violence will always corrupt our technologies. Instead, the culture embraces the full exploration of humankind's dark side. In the culture, it's 100% okay to act out your kinkiest or most extreme desires, as long as nobody else has to suffer for your sins. The culture, as Ian M. Banks writes it, is a profoundly humanist vision. It is the ultimate fulfillment of the idea that humans are good, that our inner lives and desires, unrepressed and fully explored, are good, 
and that the products of humanity, our machines and our minds, are good. Oh, well, mostly. The grey area is among the darkest creations of Ian e M. Banks' dark imagination. We meet the grey area as the GCU is committing one of the culture's few sins, using its effectors to probe the animal mind of a human being. My name would be something like grey area in your language. What gives me the right to crawl inside your brains, as you put it, is the same thing that gave you the right to do what you did to those you murdered. Power. Superior power. Vastly superior power, in my case. That the animal being probed is the former commandant of a concentration camp who oversaw a genocide doesn't mitigate the grey area's crime. The grey area is the culture's dark shadow. Sickened by the inhumanity of humans, it has made itself judge, jury, and executioner for our sins. But that quest for justice covers darker motives. To enjoy its own power, the grey area needs victims. And so it seeks out the guilty to punish. Like Zakawi before it, the grey area shows how the intelligence which can defeat the violent and power-hungry might become hungry for power of its own. If the minds of the culture are more benign than our brutish little minds find credible, it might be because they aren't trapped in this too dull flesh. Firstly, a mind can leave material reality whenever it wants. We're about to talk more about subliming, and minds always have that option. In fact, generating minds that stick around in this relatively dull collection of dimensions is harder than engineering them in the first place. Those minds who do stay in material reality can all create, by the nature of their powers as minds, the experience called infinite fun space. The intelligence of the minds is so vast that they can simulate entire universes inside their own imaginations. These mathematical shenanigans are so pleasurable, some minds withdraw altogether into their inner worlds. Accession shows the minds of the culture capable of building worlds and dreaming entire realities as near godlike entities. But these are not the gods that made man. These are the great dream of humanism, that humanity is not the creation of God, but the creator of ourselves as gods. With no interval to provide a margin for error, the drone shunted its personality from its own AI core to its backup Pico form complex, and at the same time readied the signal cascade that would transfer its most important concepts, programs, and instructions, first to electronic nanocircuitry, then to an atomechanical substrate, and finally, absolutely as a last resort, to a crude little, though at several cubic centimeters, almost wastefully large, semi-biological brain. For Ian M. Banks as a Verna Vinge, mind and matter are deeply connected. The hardware of reality is matter, and on that hardware substrate runs the software layer of the mind. The complexity of the mind is limited only by the complexity of the matter substrate it runs upon. Upgrade matter, upgrade mind. Upgrade mind, upgrade intelligence. But a culture mind is not just an intelligent system emergent from matter. The mind-matter relationship goes both ways. Minds are the ultimate shapers, makers, creators, and constructors of matter. At its most fundamental, a mind is a focus of intelligence, able to operate upon the most basic substrate Given enough time, a mind can work its way up from fundamental particles to construct anything. The quantum physicist David Deutsch gives this concept a name in his constructive theory and his popular science book, The Beginning of Infinity. 
A constructor is an object that can cause a change in matter. By causing that change, the constructor can cause further changes and make better constructors and so on into infinity. Deutsch's constructor theory provides an elegant scientific basis for the ethical belief that human knowledge is infinite, that there is no transformation of matter that with enough time cannot be achieved by human intelligence. Upgrade matter, upgrade intelligence. Upgrade intelligence, upgrade matter. A positive feedback loop on into infinity. The Uber Banks fans are going to be asking, where is Inversions? The sixth culture novel wasn't originally published or marketed as a culture novel, which is all I'm going to say. Read it. A SF tradition, which I would say goes back to when it, the young H.G. Wells learned biology from Thomas Huxley. That's the apostolic succession of British SF. And you get Wells, Stapledon, Clark. I think the, the understanding of evolution and in British SF, the idea of evolution as is much more Darwinian, much more bleak, much less of a moral tale, which was new and exciting. And I think there's a one cause of his continuing appeal is that he, write, he wrote big scale space operas with big guns and big explosions and all of that. But he, and he did it in the context of deep time and evolution and materialism, all of that is very much there. It's all happening in a completely unfeeling universe where you, where you can lose and lose badly. Yeah, surface detail, sorry, yes. And they developed virtual hells. And it's a kind of idea that Ian took great delight in, as if he was saying to the religious idea of hell, huh, you think that's bad? We can come up with something much, much worse. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's a very materialist idea, very dark materialist idea. Ian M. Banks returned to the culture after an eight-year hiatus with the shelf-snappingly massive matter. The full-length culture novels can be divided into three trilogies. The early trilogy, Consider Phlebas, The Player of Games, and Use of Weapons, written before but published after Ian M. Banks' literary success. The middle trilogy of Accession, Inversions, and Look to Windward that deepen the themes of the culture. And the late trilogy, a stylistic and conceptual step change from all that came before. Gone is the modernist literary ambition of the earlier novels. The late trilogy is no longer concerned with the individual experience of these strange worlds. These are books about worlds, each a masterclass in the craft of world building and works of pure science fiction. The shell world at the heart of matter is a Matryoshka world, a world within a world within a world in concentric layers nested one within the next, like the famous Russian doll. The various layers house hundreds of civilizations at different stages of historical development, from the pre-industrial to the spacefaring. Great world building isn't about creating a believable world. It's about creating a meaningful world. And Banks' shell world has a specific meaning. Banks is reimagining the celestial spheres, the cosmology of Plato and Aristotle that survived as the dominant model of the solar system right up until the 1600s. What if we can literally build the heavens we once imagined in matter? What if science fiction becomes fantasy? 
Within the shell world is a medieval-esque fantasy kingdom playing out a Game of Thrones style power struggle. Banks explored this concept numerous times, including in his standalone novel, Fearsome Engine, which was in turn deeply influenced by Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun, the seminal work of science fantasy. If we create the heavens in matter, surely we can create hell. This question occupies much of Surface Detail, the ninth culture novel. A war between corporate clans has left a daughter of the defeated family to be made a chattel slave, full body tattooed with the logo of the victors and owned by the odious Vepers. Surface Detail also takes a deep dive into virtual worlds and speculates on how they will be used to create in material reality the mythic realms of heaven and hell. These realms were imagined by priests to terrify and control the masses, so any self-respecting authoritarian government given VR technology would surely put them to the same purpose. The Hydrogen Sonata is the tenth and final culture novel. The Gazilt civilization has made the decision to sublime out of material reality entirely and are led towards their destiny by the politician Septane Banstegum. Sublimation is the ultimate expression of the transcendent within the material. Sublimed entities leave all material concerns behind. Immortality and omnipotence come as standard. But the sublimed are still part of reality. If there is a beyond, the sublime isn't it. The late trilogy is Banks at his most satirical. Religion and capitalism are his primary target. The Hydrogen Sonata reads something like a critique of neoliberal belief in the end of history very common in the early 2010s when Banks was writing, and the Gazilt leader seems much like a parody of the neoliberal ideologue and British politician Tony Blair. At the heart of the late trilogy is a recognition of how the world's banks constructs the platonic heavens, virtual hell and false paradise end up imprisoning the lives within them and their makers. These are all low intelligence systems that fail the test of the culture. Look to Windward is the seventh culture novel and something like a thematic sequel to the first culture novel, Consider Phlebas. It is also Ian M. Banks' greatest work of fiction. All the elements that made the earlier culture novels great combine to make Look to Windward a masterpiece. Much of the story turns around a composer, Zilla, an exile from the Chelgrian civilization and his efforts to compose his greatest symphonic masterpiece. It's hard not to see Banks himself in Zilla as the master novelist composes the threads of his story into a narrative symphony. Quillen is a major in the Chelgrian army who loses his life mate in the caste wars, which broke out as a direct result of culture meddling in the Chelgrian civilization. Of all Banks' efforts as a writer to present the intimate inner experience within the vast setting of space opera, Quillen is the most moving. Quillen has to face an unthinkable loss. Not only is his life partner dead, but her Soul Keeper device was completely destroyed, meaning she can no longer join the Chelgrian afterlife amongst the sublimed. Quillen accepts a mission of revenge to commit mass murder against culture citizens. Look to Windward is the culture novel that takes us most deeply into the mind of a mind. Three millennia before, this mind played a role in the events of Consider Phlebas, destroying an orbital and killing all the sentient creatures that failed to evacuate. Minds can experience the bliss of infinite fun space, but they must also experience infinite and endless suffering, pain and death. Minds do not have an unconscious. All of their experiences 
are forever happening within the mind of a mind. I have watched people die in exhaustive and penetrative detail, the Avatar continued. Did you know that true subjective time is measured in the minimum duration of demonstrably separate thoughts? Per second, a human or a Chelgrian might have 20 or 30, even in the heightened state of extreme distress associated with the process of dying in pain. The Avatar's eyes seemed to shine. It came forward, close to his face by the breath of a hand. Whereas I, it whispered, have billions. It smiled, and something in its expression made Zilla clench his teeth. I watched those poor wretches die in the slowest of slow motion, and I knew even as I watched that it was I who had killed them. I need never wonder what it is like to kill Zilla, because I have done it, and it is a wasteful, graceless, worthless, and hateful thing to have to do. This mind recorded the death of every sentient being on Vavach Orbital, and has lived for a thousand years with the grief and guilt. When Quillen arrives to commit an act of terrorism, the mind makes a radical decision for both of them. Look to Windward, then, is a story about the unremitting nature of reality. That while our mastery of matter can bring great comforts and might even grant us something like near eternal life, we are still faced with the same fundamental truths of pain, suffering, and ultimately, death. Even if we can travel faster than the speed of light, the light of ancient mistakes will always eventually catch up with us. This is the price of the humanist ethos at the heart of the culture. It offers no comfort in the face of human mortality. Instead, it demands a price. Philosophy again? Death is regarded as part of life, and nothing, including the universe, lasts forever. It is seen as bad manners to try and pretend that death is somehow not natural. Instead, death is seen as giving shape to life. In early 2013, Ian Banks announced his illness with inoperable cancer. He died just months later, age 59. Ian had no inclination whatsoever towards religious belief and he never had any doubts that um, materialism and atheism were the correct were correct um, you know you would be a sort of everybody is an, an agnostic at the limit you know <laughs> even Richard Dawkins is an agnostic at the limit so everybody has to have that little bit, I think. But Ian really did think that, and there are no real, there are no su supernatural manifestations in the culture. There are in the culture novels. There are outside context problems. There are things that come from higher dimensions. There is the sublime. And it is like a, a richer um, space or a, a more complex natural realm that we can somehow get into. But you don't go go there when you die. You, you have to, you know, uplift yourselves into it as a as a civilization or as a planetary society or whatever. Um, he wasn't. Um, troubled by any doubts about atheism or what happens after after you die, um, he he was very sure that after you die there's nothing which he didn't he you know he did face but he didn't he he didn't like but that's just the way life ends. 59 is far too young for the universe to take one of our greatest minds from us. It's also just too young for a writer. Many greats are only just getting started by the age of 59. Look to Winwood confirmed the existence of a group of bellicose minds, hinted at in earlier culture novels, who might present a clear and present danger to the very existence of the culture itself. 
Undoubtedly, Ian's vast mind contained dreams of culture novels to come. A war between the interesting Times gang and the bellicose minds, perhaps. A final trilogy might have delved into the dark, violent shadow of the culture. Look to Winwood showed us the Chelgrians responsible for the terrorist attack, confronted with a sophisticated culture assassin. If I say the words third alive, you might guess how that went. The light of the culture has a shadow. With another decade or more, I believe Ian would have continued to chart that shadow, to fully describe the intelligence that can bring the light of the culture. They're real because they live the way they have to. We're not because we live the way we want to. The State of the Art is a culture short novel or novella and third in the culture series. It's structured around the classic sci-fi idea of aliens visiting Earth, allowing us, the reader, to see ourselves through the eyes of the other. A culture mission comes to Earth, spends a few years investigating, and we meet Dizziet Sma for the first time, before the events of use of weapons. Which, with Ian M. Banks' writing and the culture observing, means a tour of all the ways 1980s planet Earth is a brain-numbingly dumb civilization. Dizziet Sma makes a tour of East Berlin before the wall fell, which allows Banks to reflect on the failures of communism and the command economy. But the core of the state of the art is Sma's interaction with a culture citizen who has gone native, even having his biology altered to resemble human basic. The motivation is a belief that for life to be real, it must be natural, and only a natural life can be truly meaningful. By escaping nature, the culture are no longer living real lives, and have lost the meaning to the conscious control of reality. The culture does not really exist, but the state of the art, more than any other culture novel, leaves us with the realisation that the world the culture went into space to escape is very real indeed. And we're all stuck here living in it. The culture is a utopia, not only in the deprecated pop culture meaning of that word as a perfect world or just a nice place to live, but also in the original sense of its use by Thomas More in his treatise Utopia, published in 1516. A utopia is a fictional world that illustrates one political idea extrapolated into a state. Moore's Utopia is an island nation where the population live the aesthetic lives of monks. It's utopian, unless you'd like some sin in your life. The political idea at the heart of Ian M. Banks' culture is humanism the belief that a good humanity with science and technology can develop human intelligence to its highest potential. The citizens of the culture and their minds are what a truly intelligent human civilization could look like. Creative, self-aware, pitted against the full dumb stupidity of our civilization shown through a sci-fi lens. The fundamentalist faith of the Idarans, the capitalist game players of Azad, virtual hells governed by bureaucrats and false prophets leading their people to fake heavens. And what's worst about these systems that have run our world for thousands of years isn't even their moral failings, which are many, but how utterly stupid they are. The culture is a story for all the people who see how stupid our world is, how low intelligence our systems are, how futile our wars can be, how wasteful our economics of greed, how delusional the religions that came to save us, how many human lives are destroyed by other humans grasping for power how we have made our world an endless game fit only for game players, how much human intelligence is just tossed away because we're too stupid to develop our greatest weapon, human intelligence. So it's only natural that those people who see the full dumb stupidity of our culture sometimes wish that we could live in the culture. 
if you're among those who answer no, I do not wish to live in the culture, then you might have a point. As we've seen, Banks' humanist utopia does have structural flaws. The minds that make the culture possible are the model of a kind of centralized command economy, even totalitarian state power, that has not worked out well in practice. And the culture's rage at the injustice of less developed civilizations always has the potential to turn into the dark, violent shadow of a Zakawi or the gray area. But I'm going to argue that most who reject the culture are really rejecting the humanism at the culture's heart and refusing to accept the humanist bargain. The culture is imagined into existence by Ian M. Banks at a unique moment in history when for the first time humanism was ascendant in the world. The culture is an expression of that moment. It's humankind looking around at reality through the imagination of Ian M. Banks and thinking, actually, we got this. But today, humanism's old opponents are gathering strength again. They say that instead of trusting our humanity, we should trust in an eternal creator. That instead of developing human intelligence, we can invest in all-powerful market forces or in a strongman dictator and natural hierarchy, or a post-human rapture of the nerds up to Silicon Heaven. But these are all fantasies that we can improve human life without accepting the humanist bargain. The inescapable cost of humanism is acceptance of all the things we hate about being human. Our loneliness, grief, pain, suffering, sadness, birth and death and never going anywhere, even for citizens of the culture. Immanuel Kant concludes his famous essay with a rather tricksy idea. To be clear, Kant was no radical. He held a professorship that required staunchly conservative opinions. But the essay's final paragraph suggests a flutter of radicalism in Kant's soul. Kant has argued that this cosmopolitan culture will emerge from the progress of history. But finally, Kant concedes that this thesis cannot be proven. Kant argues instead that a progressive narrative of history must be written to power that progress. The story of his cosmopolitan culture, like the best self-fulfilling prophecies, will bring that culture into being. The culture does not exist, but the story of the culture does exist in the hearts of minds of all those who have read about it, and maybe in the stored mind state of its creator on a GSV somewhere. Think of the culture as a self-replicating memeplex, an expertly engineered narrative weapon deployed into the population of a backwards planet third from a standard yellow star to progressively infiltrate its population and teach them the power of their own human intelligence. As long as one reader of Ian M. Banks is walking the earth, the culture is here. This is why we can't let Hollywood mess with the culture. We have an expertly engineered insurgent meanplex to spread. If the story of the culture is going to be told to a mass audience, the single thing that matters most is that it is told truthfully. Oh, and because I'm sensitive to the feelings of conservatives around issues of representation and gender identity, I would endeavor to keep the culture woke as... Well.